Folks, if there's one thing that I've learned from making two feature films, one of which went viral, and an ass load of short films, one of which went viral, and dozens of these YouTube videos, one of which went pretty viral, it's this. I'm basically a one-hit wonder in everything I tried to do. But I've also learned that the marketing and presentation of your film or video is absolutely crucial for its success. This is the YouTube era, folks. There are literally billions of years worth of video content being uploaded every second or something like that. So if you want your film to actually stand out and get seen, you need to be focusing on your poster, your thumbnail, your title. This is what makes people intrigued enough to click in and give your work a shot. Why blow your life savings on your semi-autobiographical found footage time travel film if nobody's gonna watch it. Jeez. Hey, my script. I'm saving you from yourself. This thing absolutely bombed online, bro. Also, get a vasectomy! So in this video, I'm gonna be talking about my successes and failures trying to get my work seen on YouTube. We're gonna be talking about your film's title, your thumbnail, your poster, all that stuff, and what you can do to give it the best chance at finding an audience. And we're even gonna be sitting down with a professional film poster designer to talk about what you can do to not f this up in your own films. Okay, so before we talk about the visual side of marketing your film, let's talk about the title because it's actually just as, if not more important. Now, what makes a good title? Obviously, a good title should be meaningful for your film thematically. A title, just like a title of a fine art painting, that's going to be what your viewer goes into your film with. So that's going to color and be a lens through which they perceive your film and change how they interpret anything that happens within that film. So it's very important for artistic reasons. However, you also want that thing to be catchy. You want people to remember it. You want people to associate it with your film. But in this modern day and age, there's other considerations to take into account. For example, SEO ability, right? You want that search engine optimization ability, which means that if I type your film's title into Google, am I gonna be able to find your film really easily? So a bad example of that would be if you called your film something like that thing. Because if I go to Google and I type in that thing, I'm not gonna find that thing. I'm gonna find some other thing that's not your film. So for example, if you made that movie Velvet Buzzsaw with Jake Gyllenhaal, great title for search engine optimization because you type that into Google and that's exactly what you're gonna find. You're not gonna find anything else. There's no room for confusion. If you came up with the movie and you called it, I don't know, Monkey Fucker Island, that's great because you're gonna find Monkey Fucker Island when you type that in. You might not wanna go there and it might not be a good title, but this is something to think about when you're making your film. You don't want to be too generic. And you can bet your ass that monkeyfireisland.com is also available. You know, don't base your title off if the domain name for it is available, but you know, it's just a small factor to consider. And the last two things to think about with your title, and they're very big and they apply to your poster too, is one, does it inspire curiosity? And two, how does it work in an additive or synergistic way with your poster or your key art? Because a title is never gonna live in a vacuum. It's going to be working against or with your poster, your trailer, your key art, right? So together, they can be more than the sum of their parts. So if we take a look at my viral feature film, Bad is Bad, that had a pretty crazy title. Let's talk about it for a second. Bad is Bad. It was unique. It was kind of catchy in a stupid way. It completely summed up what the movie was, which is just, you know, bad people are bad. It made sense to us and it just felt right. So it's a bold title, but I think it worked really well for us. And the only thing that it had going against it, which we didn't even realize till after we made the film, was that it is also the name of a Huey Lewis and the News song. You like Huey Lewis and the News? Bad is bad. But you know what? Even that worked out for me, because literally the only Hollywood meeting I ever got off of the success of Bad is Bad was from some producer who was looking up the Huey Lewis and the News song Bad is Bad to jam out to, found my movie instead, ended up watching the whole thing, and then hit me up. But that's a story for another video. I think they're undisputed masterpieces, hip to be square. Now my second feature was called The Hands You Shake. And I thought that was okay. I thought that was a good title. It kind of got you thinking of what that means. The hands you shake, not the grades you make. That's where the phrase came from. And I think if that had been paired with a strong poster concept that was additive to that title, we might've been onto something, but I think the poster was really weak and we're gonna get into that in a little bit. And then if we look at my viral short film, we've got Will the Machine. Now there's some things I really didn't like about this title and we struggled for a long time to come up with the best title. Eventually we did settle on this despite my misgivings about it. For one, it's got quotation marks in the title, which is a real pain in the ass and I hate typing it out. And then you gotta do like 
double quote will, single quote the machine, single quote, double quote. It's really confusing. And you know, you can't always italicize or underline. So just causes a lot of problems. The other annoying thing is it kind of just sounds like the first half of a question, you know, like will the machine be working tomorrow? I, I don't know, but I think it's a unique title. It says a lot about this character, makes you want to know more about who he is. And I think it more importantly worked really synergistically with our key art and our poster because you saw this jacked guy with a helmet, staring into a mirror, you're like, I guess that's Will. He's a machine? Interesting. I want to know why he's a machine. That's what the short film's about. And of course, willthemachine.com is available, which is a nice little bonus. Now compare Will the Machine with some shorts that I made that didn't find such a large audience, and you've got those monthly short films that I made that are here on the channel. Since we were making a short film every single month, we didn't want to spend a lot of time on the titles, and we just gave them a formula of calling them the and whatever the short film was about. That way they would all be linked together in a simple way, and we wouldn't waste a lot of time on the titles. This was a bad idea, because what we ended up with was a bunch of super generic, crappy titles. For example, look at the flash drive. I thought these were really cool at the time. We probably put more money and effort into these three linked short films than we did for most of the other monthly films, but they had the worst title of the bunch, the flash drive. It's the most generic, nothing title for this film that we could possibly do. So I wish I would have renamed it. And in fact, the thumbnails are really weak for most of these two. I just pulled a still from the video, threw the title on there, and that was it. And it didn't work out too well for most of these. But let's talk about titles for short films on YouTube specifically, because this is something that I've thought a lot about and done a lot of experimentation with myself too. Now, if you look at those old monthly short films, I would start the title with just the title. And then in parentheses, I would put the genre of film that it was. So it would say the neighbor in parentheses, comedy short film, the flash drive, dark thriller short film. And the reason I did that was because I wanted to improve the SEO of those videos. I wanted people to just look up dark thriller short film and mine would pop up and YouTube would know what kind of video it was. And I also figured that if people just saw the title, for example, if it just said the neighbor, they would have no idea what they're about to click into and they would just be less willing to take that risk to watch a nine minute long short film that they don't even know what the genre is, right? These titles also have the benefit of being very short, which if you keep your title under 50 characters, YouTube won't cut off your title, which it does in a lot of scenarios, like when you're on your phone or when it appears on a search result. Sometimes the title will get abbreviated and that kind of hurts your chances of somebody clicking in and watching your video. So these titles were short, but despite that, for the most part, these titles didn't work that well. The exception was The Neighbor, which did get a decent amount of views, but it took a very long time for it to rank in search, which is how it got those views. People type in comedy short film and it comes up pretty high in the rankings, but it took many years for it to get that place in the search results. So my new recommendation for you would be to do what the pros do. And for the pros, let's look at the short film channel Amaletto, which has millions of subscribers. And that's where we originally released our short film, Will the Machine, and where it went viral. They have so much data and so many films to look at as a sample size that I just trust that they know that they're doing the best thing that you can do for getting people to click on a short film. And what they do is they put the log line of the film followed by the title as the title of the YouTube video. And what that does is it's making a very long title so it will get abbreviated and cut off in certain scenarios. However, it's telling people exactly what they're about to be clicking into and it is building the curiosity for the viewer. For example, when they posted Will the Machine, they called it a high school football star finally meets his match, Will the Machine. And they put a still from the film. They didn't use the poster thumbnail that I sent them, which looked very slick and professional. And I noticed that they do this for pretty much all of their short films. They don't use actual key art. They just pull a still from the film and throw it up there. I'm not sure if that's because sometimes they receive posters that they don't like and then that becomes a whole process for them and it just streamlines and makes their whole process uniform if they just pull a still from every single short that they get or if it's because they trust their own judgment to pull the relevant image from the film that's going to work the best with the title that they choose either way that's what they do which is kind of encouraging for some of us who don't want to spend a whole lot of time on thumbnails for example if they're able to make it work with just a still pulled directly from the film, maybe you can too. So I think this Amaletto way of titling short films is probably the best way to go. You gotta think about your short film doesn't have the entire marketing campaign that some feature film would have where people have already seen the trailer, they've seen the billboards, they've seen the posters when they go see your film's title up in the theater. You don't have that. You're just a complete stranger that's just appearing out of nowhere. So putting your log line right up there up front so people can get the gist of what this film's about is a good way to entice more people to click in and watch your film. And another thing that 
Sorry, one more thing. Can you put this into the video? It's a message for the viewers. This message from the future is brought to you by Artlist.io, the home of the greatest stock music library in the history of the past and the future. In the future, everybody uses Artlist for their stock music, and there's a good reason. One, it doesn't sound like stock music. It sounds excellent. It sounds like something you hear on the radio. It sounds like something you would want to listen to just to drown out other sounds that you don't want to hear. The other reason is they're adding new music and new sound effects every day. So you can imagine by the year 2047, what that library looks like. And they have great search features. You can search by genre, by mood, by video type, by BPM, by vocals, by no vocals. You can find a track you like and then go look for similar tracks to that track. It's incredible. And they got all kinds of plans. If you're just starting out, they got a plan that's cheaper that you can even pay monthly. If you're like me, you get the Pro Creator plan and you can use unlimited tracks for basically whatever you can even think of that you'd want to put music in. And the great thing is you're getting a music library and a sound effects library. You're killing two birds with one stone. Look, future Kent has a lot of regrets in his life. An Artlist subscription was never one of them. It paid for itself many times over. You don't want to be going around buying tracks piecemeal for this client or this video or this film. You want one subscription that can just get all of your music covered for the entire year. That's what you want. So try out Artlist today. Use the link in the description below and you'll get two months free on me. Okay? I, can, I gotta go. Just cut the video. Cut the video. All right, that's all I gotta say about titles. Let's talk about the visuals. Talking about your posters, your key art, your thumbnail. Now back in the day, all these print materials would be very important because that would be your poster, but it would also be your DVD box, your VHS cover. And fortunately, all of those were vertical formats. So they were pretty much the same thing most of the time. But these days we have a super annoying additional piece of art we have to create, which is that 16 by nine thumbnail image. So close your eyes and imagine a nightmare hellscape world where you have to create a vertical poster and a horizontal poster that's the same thing and make them look great in both scenarios. Now open your eyes. Welcome to hell. You're also going to need a one by one for the gram, you stupid bitch. So you're going to need a poster that works in multiple different aspect ratios, but how do you find that and what makes for a good poster in the first place? Well, luckily you can hear it straight from the horse's mouth on my Patreon, which you should definitely check out, patreon.com slash I sat down with a professional film poster designer, John Godfrey over at chargefield.com, who made the posters for Will the Machine and my most recent short, Last Laugh, Inc. Here's what he had to say. What makes a good film poster for a short film. It all just comes down to like a compelling image. Sometimes picking that compelling image requires you to be like a step removed from your film because uh, you know you, you know the backstory and all the characters arcs and everything in your head. And then you watch a film and you look at like this still and you're like, oh, this was right before Robbie told Margo that this happened and it's like means so much to you. And to the viewer, they look at this and it means absolutely nothing to them. It's two big faces that, you know, actors they don't know. It's not really like grabbing them. This is like a micro budget feature that a filmmaker approached me with. And I think this is a good example of what we were talking about earlier in picking like your most compelling still because I haven't seen, I didn't see the film, but he did share the trailer with me. He liked it a lot. It's like a nice picture and, you know, it might mean something more in terms of the film itself, but I knew in terms of selling this film, it wasn't going to do the most work of any of the shots. So um, watching the trailer, there was a shot. This doesn't have the VFX. This was the raw that he sent me, but there's green sand basically. And I'm like, you know, you've got a film and there's green sand like that. That's something interesting, right? And you got a sunset, you got like, you know, dramatic lighting, you've got green sand, so I figured, you know, that is the picture to run with. That's going to get people interested. So it's all about, I feel like, selecting the right image. Because I feel like this one gets you a little bit more interested in the film than, like, the shot of his back, which I feel like doesn't... So one question that a lot of people watching this are probably wondering is, what stage would you suggest filmmakers start thinking about and planning for their posters and key art. It's really something like from the beginning, you know, like we were talking about, like with photography and stuff, you should start thinking about it then, like start thinking, you know, maybe I should get some photos, you know, so this can, so I can sell this movie, like once it's done. There's always the option of doing that. After the fact, you know, most big marketing campaigns by like the big studios, they do photo shoots later on. 
but now but you know with an independent film everyone's like scattered like afterwards so you got to do it like on set that means you should take actual photos from an actual photo camera while you're on set still you want high quality images that you can give to a designer to make the strongest key art possible. You should also be seeking out outside feedback on your concepts for your titles and your posters because you're gonna be so lost in the sauce and have tunnel vision on your project that you're not going to have the most objective viewpoint on what's actually exciting and enticing about your specific film to a stranger. And lastly, try to experiment with alternate thumbnails and posters. Just have them at the ready if you can. When I put up Last Lap Inc., I had like four different versions of the thumbnail for that film at the ready. I had different titles at the ready and I knew I was gonna be experimenting, trying to find what got the highest click-through rate or CTR percentage for that film. That just means that when people saw my film appear on their YouTube search results or their homepage, how many people clicked in? You want that percentage to be as high as possible. And the way you get there is by experimenting with your thumbnail and your title. Your goal is to try to stop somebody's mouse in its tracks with something visually striking. And if you wanna see how well your thumbnail might hold up, what you can do is actually take a screenshot of your YouTube homepage, or if you're a sophisticated man of culture, your Vimeo staff pick page, and go ahead and pho Photoshop your thumbnail on top of one of those images. How does it stack up? Are you honestly going to click on your thumbnail more likely than any of the other thumbnails on that homepage? If not, you need to fix that. So look, I don't have all the answers. I'm not gonna act like I do, but I just wanted to bring this topic to your attention because this is something that can literally change the entire trajectory of a film's success and therefore your career's entire trajectory. Yet most people don't even think about it until their film is already completely wrapped. And at that point, it may be too late. And then the other last piece of the puzzle in your film's marketing campaign is of course the trailer, but that is a topic for a whole nother video. So, hey, Jesus. this is, don't take it personally, made some notes, streamlined the first act, it's really starting to flow now. Also, had an idea for the poster, picture this, giant cuckoo clock, right? That represents time, bring us in thematically. And then I'm popping out of the little door, all futured out. I got the chromed out jeans, metallic slinkies for sleeves, right? All the... I gotta go. I gotta go. Can't get five minutes to myself. Future looks awful, man.